Thank you everyone for joining us this evening and a special thanks to Gemma for organising this because it certainly is way beyond my technical abilities um, and thank you to Carrie for agreeing to do it. I'm just, I'm just um, hoping that everyone is well, that everyone will keep in touch with each other and look after each other and uh, I've got a few words to say at the end of this session, a few bits of news, but I'll, I will now hand you over to Carrie. Um, Carrie, if you could just say a little bit about yourself before you start with the, um, with the webinar. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, so my name's Carrie. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight um, about progress on the Kendall to Lancaster Towpath Trail project, um, which is at its midway point. Um, I started work just over a year ago and we've got kind of the rest of this year to, to deliver the project. Um, if you don't know what, what the project is, I'll quickly tell you a bit about it and then I'll start the presentation and I can let you know what we've been up to. Um, so its full name is the Kendall to Lancaster Towpath Trail Project Phase 2, which, um, as Gemma said, is a bit of a mouthful. So I will just be calling it the Towpath Trail Project for the rest of this presentation. Um, it's a National Lottery Heritage funded project which aims to build community and visitor engagement with the northern reaches um, of the Lancaster Canal. It was brought in to complement the restoration work um, at Stainton Aqueduct. You'll know, I'm sure, that that's been quite a big investment um, for a number of different funders, including the National Lottery, uh, Rural Payments Agency, local authorities, Canal and River Trust. Um, so they really wanted to, to create a role, a community engagement role, which is my role, to be encouraging people to come and visit that area once we've made the investment in restoring it. Um, and the project also furthers the wider aims of Lancaster Canal Regeneration Partnership and its members. Um, so members of Lancaster Canal Regeneration Partnership include Canal and River Trust, who employ me. So I'm sure some of you have probably met me and you'll have seen me wearing the blue t-shirt. Um, uh, so they're the accountable body for the funding. So they, they employ me, but I'm working for the whole of Lancaster Canal Regeneration Partnership, including Lancaster Canal Trust, the IWA and the members of that group. Um, in kind of what we want to do as a partnership is encourage use of the towpath for well-being purposes, for leisure, um, use it as a connection, as a, in like a physical connection between tourist sites in the area um, and also all of that and getting people out using it and buying into the canal is generating support ultimately for the restoration of the canal. Um, lots of people would like to see some kind of restoration or regeneration work on the Lancaster all the way back up to Kendall. So hopefully this is a little stepping stone in that. Um, and the, the part of the project that is phase two, you'll see, it, you'll see it in a minute, it's phase two of the project. That's because it's an area-based project and I focus on um, kind of the second, the second step of, of the canal. So if you think of Kendall to Sedgwick is the first bit, which is in private ownership. And then you've got Sedgwick down to Stainton which is the second stage area wise. And that is the main focus of what I do. It's the three settlements of Stinkton, Sedgwick and Hincaster. Um, although we do, um, we, uh, we, we do a bit of work at like Crooklands as well, just because it's a good access point. Right, so I'll just share the presentation now. If I can work out how. Let's see if we can get it full screen for you. There we go, brilliant. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run you all through some of the stuff that, we, that um, we did on the project last year. So our highlights of 2019. I'll talk a little bit about some of the lessons learned um, then not formal lessons learned. We do have some formal evaluation work going on, but it's just really my thoughts of the things that um, I've learned on this project that I found helpful. Um, you know, little learning curves for me. And then I will talk a little bit about uh, my plans for 2020, which may have changed a little bit now um, in light of the recent circumstances um, and also a little bit about the plans that I'm putting in place to make the impact of the project last longer than that. So the project is due to finish in um, January 2021. So realistically going to be delivering up until Christmas this year um, but I would like the impact of that to be a bit longer lasting um, and I'll finish off with a little update 
from the partnership, I've got a little bit, a few little bits of news from Lancaster Canal Regeneration Partnership, um, which is kind of bigger picture stuff. So my first highlight of uh, 2019 is the dry stone walling. Um, so the lottery who are funding the project would really like to see the, the dry stone walls at Hincaster Horsepath, um, part of the um, scheduled monument listing. They'd really like to see those restored. Um, and look, looking a bit better, they've not had a lot of love. Um, and in order to do that, they've given me a budget for training, for training people and for um, basically booking training sessions for the community and for volunteers at the Drystone Walling Association. Um, some people may have seen these advertised. If you haven't, get in touch with me if you want to get involved because there will be some more training coming up this year. So the, basically the Drystone Walling Association is delivering a number of training weekends where you will learn how to dismantle and then rebuild a dry stone wall from scratch, completely beginner level, all the health and safety stuff covered as well. So far, um, we've put 22 people through that training and I've retained 15 of those people as volunteers. So I've created a team of volunteer dry stone wallers who have been doing some excellent work already. Um, we've had to sort out permissions with Historic England and and various other people to start the work on the Hincaster walls, which will hopefully be starting this spring or summer if we're able to. So in the meantime, what the wallers have done um, is work on a practice wall. Um, so having received the training, they've gone out to, um, this is bridge 173, which is the next one along from the bridge at um, Stainton Crossing. This is actually private, private land, but he's let us go on and fix one of his walls, which is edging. It kind of um, borders almost like a castle track, maybe. Um, it, it borders, you know, what would have been an access point onto the canal. So it is still a canal adjacent wall. Um, and they've repaired about 25 metres of that and they've done a really good job. You can see what kind of the state the wall was in there on the, on the near, on the near side of this photo compared to if you look a bit further back into the distance where they've managed to build it up to. So um, that training has definitely been a highlight for me. Uh, volunteering generally as well has been going quite well. I've recruited 17 volunteers who have been meeting around about every two weeks just to carry out little bits of maintenance, small scale improvements on the canal. Most of this has been over winter so far so we've done vegetation removal, um, clearing bits of vegetation off accesses. Uh, this picture here was actually us going um, to help Lancaster Canal Trust out. You can see a couple of members of Lancaster Canal Trust, I think they're lurking at the back. Um, <laughs> but we went and spent a day at Hincaster Tunnel taking out saplings that have becoming set in, in um, the banking and things and also cutting back bramble there which freed up some really nice spring bulbs which last time I went to check her in full flower, it looks really nice. Um, and I mean that that bit of that bit of the northern reaches is already quite well looked after by Lancaster Canal Trust. Um, so as well as that, we've just been going and looking at the bits that haven't been quite so well well looked after over the last few years. So here's one example of the kind of thing we're doing. These are the steps at Stainton Crossing Bridge, and I think especially because of the works going on at Stainton, they haven't been used a lot. Um, and I don't think anyone like Canal and River Trust has been out to tidy them up. So we've cut back you know trailing vegetation that might present a trip hazard and might make it more difficult for people to come and visit the canal and we've also removed you know, vegetation that was rooting into the mortar and things like that and just generally given things a bit of a tidy up here's another highlight um this was probably one of my favorite weekends that i worked last year um so a weekend back in august it was bank, the last bank holiday weekend i think really really lovely sunny day and I was working but luckily I was working with a group of really really enthusiastic and committed young people which was the Explorer Scouts from Lonsdale and Kentdale. I had 20, 20 people come out over the space of two days to do loads of vegetation removal. So Explorer Scouts, um, I think their official age range is between 14 and 18 but the group we have were mostly 16, 17 years old, really really proficient with tools, uh, really love being outdoors and they came and got Hincaster Tunnel looking really nice for its red wheel unveiling. Um, so I think it was 6th of September, we unveiled a red wheel on Hincaster Tunnel and a red wheel is something that the Transport Trust awards to really important, really significant infrastructure. It's kind of like the blue plaques that you get on, on buildings, but it's red. 
in colour, but they, they do look very similar and it's a similar kind of purpose. Um, and Hincaster was looking a little bit um, overgrown. So the scouts came and gave up a weekend of the time to um, remove things like annual plants and to cut back low hanging vegetation so you could see the tunnel a bit better so that we could put on an unveiling ceremony on the, I think it was the 6th of September last year. It was a win-win really, because I got to have a nice load of people all at one time, lots of hands together doing a big job, which is always helpful. But it helped the scouts as well. They were able to use those hours to contribute to their community badges um, and some of their community challenges. They also received this one-off badge, which um, I designed with a company called Tolly Badges, who are quite good. They do quite a lot of scout badges. It's just a little fun souvenir, really. It didn't really mean anything apart from it's something nice to take home and it gets the image of Hincaster Tunnel out there onto people's blazers or bags or whatever they put them on. Um, and there was also a chance for them to gain some skills and for them to generally just socialise and explore and have a nice sunny weekend out getting dirty and getting stuck in and knowing that they were contributing. So this is one example of what they did. So they've taken a few little saplings out, cut back um, loads of brambles on the banking um, and the overhanging branches. You can see what a difference that one work party made. And that was a in, in terms of the support we have from the community as well, from people from Hincaster, that was definitely a highlight for me last year. Um, so another thing that I've been working on is an oral history project um, and trying to interview people essentially to record and gather stories about the northern reaches of the Lancaster Canal. This has been a big big learning curve for me as well. I'd never done anything like this before. So I've gone through some training with um, myself and a couple of volunteers, had a, um, a day of training with the Oral History Society who were absolutely brilliant and had some slightly more informal um, training with Kendall Oral History Group who are a bit more local than they have the local knowledge. So I've gotten all trained up in that. Um, there's been quite a lot of back office work to do because what I'd really like to do is deposit that with the archives. So gotten paperwork agreements and things set up for that and have managed to go out and complete three interviews. Um, unfortunately, that's had to go on hold, um, not least because when you think about the demographics of people we're interviewing, it, this was put on hold a couple of weeks ago, actually, when it, when it became clear that it was going to be uh, more difficult to interact with people in that fairly arbitrary over 70s bracket, um, especially when you're doing one-to-one -one work and you're working close to people. Um, but the aim really is to gather stories from um, a whole range of, of time periods, I think. So it's, it, it, it would be really good to interview people who um, were maybe around when the canal was getting infilled. So 60s, 60s and 70s time and to capture some local feeling around the closure of the canal, but also capturing some recent, recent history as well. So um, would like to interview people like the contractors working um, on Stainton Aqueduct and um, people working on the first furlong, that kind of thing, and get all those stories captured now because they're going to be useful in the future. Somebody will want to know more about this in the future. Um, another thing that this, um, this oral history project has done so far is I've been able to facilitate some community projects. I found that as soon as I started talking about history projects within the parishes, there were always people coming forward and saying, I've, re I've really wanted to do something like that, but I didn't have the skills, I've not had the equipment. So I've been able to um, start working with things like the parish councils and, uh, and residents and coming up with ways where we can loan equipment to each other. I can provide training and networking to get some of those little projects off the ground as well. And it's been, so it's not been something that I've had a lot of experience with. And um, because of that, I think I find it quite rewarding. And I'm really looking forward to getting that off the ground again as soon as we can. Um, excuse me one second. So back in September, um, we had a bat walk. So Diane Rollin, who's the ecologist for Canal and River Trust, came out to Stainton Aqueduct. She did a bat talk. We um, used Kia's temporary offices there on site to deliver a talk, um, followed by a bat walk. We walked to Hincaster Tunnel and back. It took about 13, 14 members of the public with us. Um, it was an event that was put on for free that they could come and attend. Um, we found three species of bat feeding around and even inside Hincaster Tunnel. 
which was really exciting. We had the bat detectors out and it went down very well with the visitors that came. Everyone left with a smile. And I think it was because it was an opportunity for them to see the canal from a different perspective, even seeing it at night um, and also being able to think and explore how our built environment and how the canal environment, even though it's kind of tied in with people's history um, and industry, how it can provide habitat and continues to provide habitat uh, for wildlife you know the bats are going to be roosting in the bridges potentially or in the larch trees um, and people found that um, yeah really exciting so there will be another one of those coming up this year hopefully so those are my highlights um, I'm just going to do a little informal run through some of the lessons that I feel I've learned um, so far on the project the first one being be present I know certainly coming from Canal and River Trust you know, as a representative for them as well. I think um, historically relations in the area have either maybe not been great or they've been fairly non-existent because quite often their staff don't go any further north than say Chewett Field or Crooklands where there's, where there's water and the waterway needs maintaining. And I found just through being there and being able to answer questions, um, just being present on the towpath, going to events, um, attending even business networking events in Kendall, um, it, I found that quite quite productive really and I feel like it's already starting to improve relationships between maybe the partnership um, or Canal and River Trust and local residents. Like I said just just through simply being there and putting your hand up and getting involved. Um, I've had to learn to be a bit more flexible in my communication. My last job I was working in, in Preston um, in you know quite a built-up area and with quite young people and I've gotten quite used to doing a lot of communication online um, by email and the first couple of events that I put on weren't particularly well attended um, when I found out why I hadn't really given the parish some of the parishes enough notice to um, promote it through maybe posters and things that their residents are used to communicating through and like communicating through so um, that was yeah that was a lesson um, that I learned really and when I get back on it, I'm going to try and get better with things like posters um, and getting better at using other people's communications channels rather than the ones that, rather than the ones that I'm used to. Uh, Timescales have been a big learning learning curve for me on this project. Um, everything that I've wanted to do took longer than I thought. I had grand plans to have the oral history work all done by now, um, but really, it's been last year was very very de development heavy, and this year. Hopefully, if we're allowed to get back out there again soon, will be a really, really big year for delivery and I'll be delivering most of the things that I planned this year. Um, being persistent, uh, but knowing when to stop. You know, you get to the point where you're trying to build a link with somebody or build a link with a group and actually that's just draining your time and you're not really going to get anywhere and knowing when to go, you know what, I'm just going to find someone else just because I you know the lottery or the funders said I should be doing work with this group doesn't mean that I can't switch things up a bit and go and look for go and look for and explore other ways to deliver the objectives um, and the last point isn't a new isn't really a, a new thing for me but I do think it's worth reiterating is don't you know not underestimating the ability and the commitment of the volunteers including the young people like the scouts uh, which got involved um, I'm I'm really chuffed that we you know so far if I put on a volunteering session I, I'm getting three or four people a time which considering it's quite a new a new thing and they're all new volunteers is really great but when I, I have had those days where I'm thinking is anybody going to come and people have turned out every time which I'm really really thankful for and really grateful for um, yeah so plans for 2020 some of these may have to be taken with a pinch of salt um, and we all know why but I'm still going to be delivering what I can um, from you know doing things like this doing virtual events um, and there's a bit more kind of development office based work that I can do anyway so the dry stone walling as I've said we were aiming to start work on the walls at Hincaster um, by mid-April um, which unfortunately isn't going to happen now um, there will still, though, be three training courses happening this year. I've got the budget to do it, so I'll be putting them on. Unfortunately, the, the session that I was planning on running in April um, has been postponed. The I've got another one booked in for June, which is looking a bit sketchy, um, but there is definitely going to be a training session in August. 
um, and I will find somewhere to put the other two on. So that's, that's, that is a plan for 2020, it's just a when. Um, and then as soon as we're able to, uh, the volunteers who are trained will be going out, uh, working alongside um, Bill Froggart, who's a heritage advisor for Canal and River Trust, um, who's gonna guide us on how we can restore those walls in line with, um, with Historic England's guidelines and, and basically just, get, just getting that done. We've already gone and done a site visit. This picture is um, the volunteers on the site visit. Um, I think they're having a bit of a talk there and learning a bit about the history of the tunnel. Um, but yeah, we've gone and had a look. There's plenty of stone that can be recovered there, which is great because it means it's not a huge investment in terms of materials. We can just go whenever we can and get to work. I've had a lot of interest from people that can't make it to the training sessions as well. Um, so I'll, I'm planning on putting on some weekend work parties for people to come and get stuck in. I've also had a lot of Canal and River Trust staff trying to get on my free training and I've had to say no. Um, but it's, it would be a really, really good thing to put on some kind of staff away days as well for people that have, you know, some basic knowledge. So maybe people like interns who want to know a bit more. And I'd really like to get that going this year. In terms of beyond, beyond 2020, I could potentially, if say every, every attendee from the training becomes a volunteer, that would be another 30 volunteers. That's very optimistic, but add that to the 15 I've got, and we could have a 40 odd strong team of trained Dryston Walling volunteers by the end of the year. And I'm really, really keen for that not to go to waste. So I've been working with Canal and River Trust volunteer team and feeding back to Canal and River Trust volunteer team um, to try to find a place to put them and to make sure that they can still they can still work i know some teams do do dry stone walling already fairly close to the area kind of around kind of around chewett field so hopefully um those skills will will continue to to be useful after the project ends um yeah the oral history project i haven't really talked about this but as well as donating those stories or depositing those stories with uh, the waterways archive those recordings are going to be combined with maybe a bit of poetry and a few more abstract sounds to create an audio trail which is going to feature um, our new interpretation which will be installed along this stretch of the towpath um, kind of between Crooklands and Sedgwick is the aim. Now this picture here isn't isn't the trail this is one um, from elsewhere on the network but this is what I'd really like to achieve with that I think this one's got 10 audio stops on it um, at key features and what people will be able to do um, what people will be able to do is just sit um, walk around the trail and either have it downloaded to their phones or there'll be a QR code that they can zap or there'll be some kind of um, model or a sculpture that, that they can listen that they will emit sound so that they can listen to it um, and actually tell people a little bit about the history of the canal all the way from when it was built up to the present day and also explain to them a little bit more about some of the restoration work that's happening currently. Um, I will talk about a bit more about the interpretation in a minute um, and as I've said these these oral history recordings will hopefully develop a really nice archive a really nice resource for the waterways archive which will be available for the public to access on a national level um, when I first started talking with the archive last year, um, I asked them to look at what they had about the Northern Reaches and it wasn't a lot. They had a few nice pictures of Hincaster Tunnel. They had a little bit about Canal Head in Kendall, um, but they couldn't find an awful lot um, actually about that region. So that will raise the profile. If, if I can get some stories in there about, about the Northern Reaches, that will raise the profile on a national level. Um, the impact of this beyond the end of the project I've said that I've been doing some work with the um, communities like the parish, like people who live in the parishes. Um, and I really hope that some of those smaller projects will get taken forward after this project has ended. Um, this is a big plan for 2020. This is um, quite a significant portion of the grant that the lottery was, that the lottery has given us and given to the partnership is for a signage and interpretation project. Um, which will be installing uh, permanent interpretation and signage between, um, I mean, the project covers Stainton, Sedgwick and Hincaster, and obviously there's those amazing heritage infrastructure there with Stainton Aqueduct, Hincaster Tunnel, 
um, and Sedgwick Aqueduct. But really, Crooklands is one of the access points if you're thinking about people, um, you know, accessing those those features on foot. So ideally, the signage will cover from all the way down there. Um, to Sedgwick and it's basically to inform people about about the canal and its history and also to signpost from nearby um, tourists to and from nearby tourist destinations. There's places like Levens Hall which have toilets, um, car parking and cafes which is something that the Northern Reaches is a bit lacking in um, especially between say Crooklands where you've got Crooklands Hotel um, and Kendall itself. Um, it, I mean, I, I have a vague idea about what I want to point out to people in what location, but apart from that, I mean, this will be going out to tender soon. I'll be getting um, an external person in to do this. And yeah, we'll, we'll see what they think really about what they think is going to engage people, whether that be models, sculptures, there may be some space for, you know, interpretive fencing or some other um, re ni nice details that could kind of endure a little bit longer. Um, and, on, and also I'd really like to produce some self-led walking tour leaflets that people can download um, so that will tell them how they can come and visit from Kendall how, or how they can come and visit from maybe further south and take themselves around it and suggest some interactive activities that they could do. Um, there will be um, a degree of community consultation here. The funders have set me a target to consult with 60 members of the of the community and some of that has happened already so I've got a few little ideas to feed in to whoever um, whoever I get on board to, to put the signage in. Um, in terms of beyond beyond the duration of this project I am aware that it, it is it's a job that will need to be done is maintaining the signage once it's in. Um, I've talked to the operations team for Canal and River Trust who already do maintenance a bit further down, a bit further down south on the Lancaster and, and initially they, they seemed up for coming up, you know, and making sure that everything was in place. Um, the other thing that I am aiming to do is recruit some community champions, which is a bit of a buzzwordy way of saying some people within the community who can come out and help keep the signs look nice. You know, maybe if they've got something at the, it's at the bottom of their property, they could come and cut the grass back from it every now and then or ring, you know, ring Canal and River Trust or Lancaster Canal Regeneration Partnerships team and let us know if anything's broken or needs replacing. So hopefully that, that will be loved and looked after into the future. Oh, I don't seem to be able to. Oh, there we go. Yeah, and this this part of the plan of the project plan um, between now and Christmas is is a bit of a tentative bit because it's about putting on community and public events. And as I'm sure we all know by now, it's not going to be that easy, certainly for the next couple of months. Um, I am planning on delivering some guided walks, including birds, bats. Um, and some heritage walks. Would really like to do a heritage open day at Hincaster and Hincaster Tunnel and or Stainton Aqueduct um, on the 11th of September. I do have a bat walk book with Diane for the 11th of September, which handily falls right in the heritage open days. It's right at the start of the heritage open days window. And the, um, the heritage open day theme for this year is hidden nature. Um, and nothing says hidden nature more than a bat flying around inside Hincaster Tunnel, as far as I'm concerned. So I think that that was quite a lucky booking and would really like to to get that organised if indeed we're having public events by then, which I hope we are. Uh, one big event that I was planning on getting involved with this year, um, and I don't really know what's happening with it because unfortunately I've not heard from them, is Kendall Torchlight. Um, there were tentative plans to have a float um, and some kind of light and sound installation that would essentially bring Hincaster Tunnel to Kendall, something involving boats and horses made from paper and yeah, sounds of people traveling through the tunnels, that kind of thing. Um, and in terms of that going on after the duration of the project, um, I'm trying to build links between the local communities and organisations like Canal and River Trust and LCRP who could hopefully run the same events again the next year. And to give an example, um, 19th of April it was supposed to be but it's been postponed until the 1st of November. 
um, I was working with Jogging Pals to organise a, a 10k run, which would go over Stainton Aqueduct. So starting at Junction 36 Conference Centre, running to Hincaster Tunnel and back is about 10k. And Jogging Pals are keen to make that a yearly thing. So this project has facilitated that link, which hopefully that is that will be the inaugural 10k and that and that will keep going. Now we are going to have to start look at, looking at other ways to deliver these events, kind of like we've done with this event tonight, moving it online, using the technology that we've got to make it happen. The 10k run, which was supposed to be the 19th of April, is the first one that we've managed to get online. Jogging Pals are now set up as a virtual 10k, which means that people can run 10 kilometres in their own time, essentially. So you can run a socially distanced 10k of your own or you can run a kilometer at a time you could run half a kilometer a day around your garden something like that you can do it up and down the stairs if you're in self-isolation i suppose um and actually collecting some evidence of that so through a log on something like strava and then submitting it to jogging pals and when they've got the evidence of that then they're posting they're going to post out tokens with a little image of saint and aqueduct on so we'll see how that goes i think that's that's a really interesting way to run a virtual event when it would have been a big outdoor event with a lot of physical activity and a lot of people very close together um but that may be the future of a lot of my events this year um yes and i would like to do some more work with young people this year i didn't do a lot of work with young people last year um one thing that i will be doing while I can't go out and about and do other stuff is develop some schools workshops that the that Canada River Trust Explorers team will be able to go out and deliver in the schools. Um, there, there were plans to work with Kendall College in the run up to Kendall Torchlight and having them help out with creating floats and the light and sound installations as a, that, that is definitely a bit tentative now. Um, and I'd love to do some more work with the Explorer Scouts in the coming year, as soon as we're allowed our uh, group gatherings again. Um, so that's it for my plans. I just thought I'd give you a few little pieces of news from Lancaster Canal Regeneration Partnership. Uh, the, the big news item really is that Audrey Smith is standing down from her role as chair. Um, you possibly already know this because the, the news has been out there for some time. I, just, I did want to mention it again because if you can think of anybody who you, th who you think might be interested in the role or you, you know, yourself might be interested, please um, go on to the Lancaster Canal Regeneration Partnership website and get in touch, um, get in touch with them um, and let them know they can send you some more information about the role. Um, a few other bits of news from them. So the Kendall to Lancaster towpath trail, so the actual path itself of which I'm working on that little section but the path itself actually goes all the way from Kendall down to Lancaster, um, is getting a brand. So Richard Frank, who is the uh, project officer for the Towpath Trail from Lancaster Canal Regeneration Partnership side, has commissioned somebody to, to create a brand to give the trail an identity. It's, I mean, it's, it's more than just a logo, but it will be something that features on interpretation boards. It will feature on promotional materials to give us something to kind of anchor to and tie it together. Um, and something that will create, a, you know, an engaging image with the public, um, something that they can use to navigate, but also, like I said, it will create an, an identity and a, and a feel for the trail. And if it, if it all goes well on this stretch, that will potentially be, you know, that has the potential to be rolled out along the whole length. So that is in the works. Please look out for that. Um, there's also the capital works are still ongoing. Well, they're on hold at the minute. Um, but there are some towpath improvements uh, in the works around Stainton. Um, I've heard today that they kind of postponed fairly indefinitely um, because we don't know when they'll be able to start again, but they will happen. Um, Stainton Aqueduct is nearly done. Again, they are, they are off site at the minute and the original plan was for them to come back in mid April um, to finish off the work on the aqueduct itself. Um, just before they came off earlier on in the year, they had opened the walkway. So all the walkways are open again. You can walk over Stainton Aqueduct, you can walk under it. Please go and visit and have a look. It's quite interesting to see it at the minute, I think, with, with the work not quite finished. Uh, maybe it doesn't look the prettiest, but it's nice to be able to see the work that they've done on it. Um, they came off, um, become, they had some issues with fish, um, 
fish eggs and they didn't they didn't want to be working in the water channel so they came off and we're going to go back on um in april i don't know i don't know when they'll be going back now but but as soon as they can they'll be getting on to finish off the aqueduct and the last little piece from lcrp is brand new shiny website which uh, richard frank has developed um the web address is lcrp.org.uk um go and have a look it's a lot easier to use and there's a lot more information on it than the old website it's also going to be easier to communicate with lcrp going forward there's an instant chat button which richard has assured me that if a message comes through while he's online he will endeavor to answer um queries straight away but you can go on there see news and um, all the latest news you'll see updates from my project as well um, a little bit about the partnership's aims um, and what you can do to get involved I thought I would talk a little bit about the elephant in the room because it's certainly been on my mind and it's sure and I'm sure it's been on your mind as well and I don't think there is an answer to this but we are feeling the impact already um, from the coronavirus outbreak um, and I've been thinking about what it might mean for our green spaces particularly the towpath because it's become clear in the last certainly in the last week that people need and want local green spaces more than ever um, i've tried to go for a walk down my little park today and it and it's very busy um, and obviously the government are encouraging people to exercise outdoors the towpath is still open for business even if you're having you know we're putting in restrictions from not official restrictions but you know the the social distancing guidelines and there are obviously concerns about people being on boats but it does raise I think it has shown that people do want to use their local green spaces and kind of what does that mean going forward? Will they be more invested in them after this? Will people um, care a bit more about their green spaces and their gardens now they've got the time to appreciate them? Um, obviously in the meantime access and activities are going to, be are going to be limited including large events and we've already seen that this is affecting pollution levels um, and things like that and um, maybe we'll see a reduction in litter and it would be really good if there are any positive impacts at all, silver lining in what is a really awful situation, whether we can try and keep, keep those going a little bit, I guess, when we get, when we get back out there. Um, there may be impacts to wildlife conservation, may not be a big impact, um, on particularly on, on, you know, Canal Towpath in Lancaster, but it, this this came from from a wildlife issue so it may start impacting trade uh, maybe some new trade regs coming in um and the one thing that i'm seeing locally is that this is an opportunity for innovation um my my local garden center has started um this week doing facetime calls so you can facetime them and they'll take you for a tour around the plants so you can pick out which plants you want um, and then they'll bring them over to you in the van um, desperate times, I think, push people to come up with new and creative ways um, to go about things. So I'm kind of interested in seeing, like I said, with the things with the 10K, that is already happening. There are already new ways of doing things coming out. So it will be interesting to see how that how that progresses for, you know, things like my project and I'm sure your projects or your hobbies, which involve being outside and around people. Um, that's it from me. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing that now. But um, if anybody has any questions at all, um, if you want to pop them in the Q&A box, um, I'll do my best to answer them. Um, I think Wendy said an hour's limit, so I can do maybe 10 minutes of questions if you've got them. Oh, um, Peter says he's posted pictures on um, the LCT Facebook of work started on the towpath at Wellheads, but they've gone away. Um, Peter, I don't know on that one, I'm afraid, because I didn't know that they were on yet. Um, but I have been told today that um, that the work isn't happening at the minute. Um, you've got my email address. So if you've got any concerns, if you bob me an email, I can put you in touch with the um, with Nick Smith or whoever's working on it from Canal River Trust side. Hopefully that um, answers your question. We do have uh, some comments. I don't know whether you can see them, Carrie. Yeah, I do. Um, yeah, thank just, you. Just to say that the lack of questions reflects your excellent coverage. I That's so. <laughs> Claire. And uh, from, can't read the name, from Lynn. 
Lyndon, um, thank you very much. That was very interesting. So if no, if no one's got any more questions or any, anything else to say, I, I'd just like to say thank you very much, Carrie, for, uh, for giving us that talk. I can't believe you've not done it before because uh, you were so, so good at it. So um, thank you very much. If it was a normal meeting, we'd have a round of applause, but let's just pretend that uh, we're all saying, all applauding you for that. Um, just a couple of other things I'd like to say. The, um, the committee, the branch committee has been working very hard or get starting to organise a series of events for 2020. And then we've been working equally as hard trying to postpone them or cancel them. And quite a lot have already been cancelled. We were going to have a balsam bash, but we can't do that now. First Go Heritage Centre, we were going to go to that, but we can't do that now. And sadly, Country Fest, which is at the end of, end of May, that has been cancelled. We found that out yesterday. Uh, and then there are other events that we haven't even got around to planning. But we'll come back, you know, later on in the year, hopefully, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to organise a few things. So um, I'd like to mention Tone Path Topics. The copy date for Tone Path Topics is the 30th of April. And I'm sure David Faulkner, our, our editor, We'll be delighted to hear any uh, stories that people have got and maybe you could tell him what you're getting up to why she's stuck at home and whether you're doing any research on canals or finding out a little bit of history or enjoying your garden his email address is in you in turn past topics and i'll ask uh, Gemma to put it on the email that she's going to send around uh, after this meeting the other thing is on the 6th of April, I'll, I'll be attending in a virtual meeting with Canal and River Trust, and it's uh, for the Northwest IWA region. So if anybody's got anything that they want me to raise, and we're not talking about, you know, the bin hasn't been emptied, we're talking about bigger issues, wider issues, then please email me. Um, my email address, I'll ask Gemma to put that on as well. Uh, Gem is going to send a follow-up email, as, as I've said, and I think I think that's about it. I'm not sure when that Gem when that follow-up email will uh, will arrive, but I'm sure Gemma will get working on it. Well, the other thing is that people might be interested to know is that this meeting we have 18 participants plus three um, Gemma, myself, and Carrie which makes a total of 21, which is very good. We don't always get that at our uh, real meetings. So hopefully we, um, our next meeting, which is the last Thursday in April, our speaker for that is Bill Frogger and Bill, Bill's going to talk to us about Canal Heritage. I'm really hoping that we can organize another webinar for that meeting because I think it's been successful i'm very pleased with it so so just to say it again thank you very much to Gemma for organizing it and thank you very much to you carrie and everybody stay safe and let's hope that we see you all again soon thank you